My friends, let's be honest. When the mainstream media is saying that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is not going well, it's actually a total disaster. Here from CNN. Ukraine's counteroffensive hasn't met expectations. Here's why progress has been slow. You are coping, coping and seeding. <laughs> and check out what they wrote. Milley urged observers to remain patient, saying he expects the counteroffensive to last as long as 10 weeks. Milly, Milly, Milly! We're halfway through! Tough time never lasts. Only tough people last. Perhaps we can read something better on Newsweek. Russia loses 31,000 soldiers in under two months amid counteroffensive. <laughs> and the Russians are the ones defending in their top tier entrenchments. How about we just take a look at the map, the facts. That was the situation one month ago on the 5th of June before the offensive. All right, analyze everything. And here's the situation now, one month later. I think you can come up with your own conclusions. Canadian journalist Neil Howard went to Ukraine and this is what he observed. Ukraine's offensive has been tough going. A month into the campaign, only a handful of villages have been liberated. Helicopters in particular are a challenge. But on the southern front line, spirits are high. By helicopters, he means the Russian Ka-52 and Mi-28N constantly buzzing over Ukrainian formations. Which once again is a sign of Ukraine's lack of air defense. Along the Zaporozhye front, Ukraine is attacking along three main sectors. On the west side near the villages of Zharebyanke and Patihetki, the Ukraines got a 3km gain and two villages. At this moment, the Ukrainian attacks are breaking their teeth along this set of fortifications north of Zharebyanke. And these are just outposts, not even the main line of defense. It was reported that ambushed Russian Cornet anti-tank missiles are causing a great deal of damage on Ukrainian vehicles going back and forth between the front line and the rear. Then we have the infamous Malatokmachka and Robotine Axis, with the Bradley slash Leopard 2 parking lot that went viral, plus 3 kilometers there as well. And they're just about to reach the first Russian line of defense centered on Robotine. Just the tip though. Just a tip. And lastly, we have the Vremievsky salient, where Ukraine has had the most success as of now with a 6 km push. But the main question is, at what cost? There are many videos I can show you, but let's focus on one of the latest ones. In total, 6 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and an IMR2 engineering vehicle were abandoned. Oryx reported 27 M2A2 Bradley ODS SA destroyed or damaged. And like the journalist from Forbes, David Axe said, equally good chance there are M2 losses that no outside observer have documented. And what about manpower losses? Russian reports talk about 13 to 16,000 Ukrainian casualties, KIA or wounded, in the past 30 days of operations. In preparation for this offensive, Ukraine has mobilized left and right across the country. And there are also growing reports of foreign recruits from Latin America within the ranks of the Ukrainian army, mainly Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico and Argentina, which is in itself an indication of the overall situation. At this moment, it seems Ukraine is preparing a major offensive in the Kahovka Reservoir sector, with the main armored fist assembled near Lopkove. We're talking about part of the NATO-trained 117th and 118th Mechanized Brigades plus one tank battalion of the 116th Mechanized Brigade. And let me tell you, there will be a lot of fisting in this sector. Meanwhile, the Kahovka Reservoir has almost dried out and turned into some mushy desert, which could theoretically be crossed by Ukrainian forces. Oh, sorry CNN, I cut you off. So why was progress so slow? A Ukrainian soldier drafted from a police unit called Yevhen told the New York Times, they dug in. They mind, they're ready. It is difficult, but there's no other option. And here, the BBC. The lethal minefields holding up Kyiv's counteroffensive. The soldiers express frustration about a lack of mine clearing equipment and a shortage of sappers, four of whom had been injured in recent weeks. That's the thing, like you can see in this video, hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers are going through NATO basic training in the UK. And let me be clear, that's great. But they won't ever be able to apply these fancy tactical stunts if they can't even get through minefields. 
In this footage, you can see Ukrainian troops walk through another steel graveyard to destroy Bradley IVs in a T-64 that reportedly got hit when crossing over a minefield. However, what's worrying is that this happened relatively far from the front line. And in this video, we see the aftermath. A Soviet-era IMR-2 and a German Bergepanzer II were sent to salvage these vehicles and bring them back to the rear for repair. So it's good news, but as you can imagine, it's very tedious and time consuming. However, it goes to show how important these engineering vehicles are for Ukraine. And let me be blunt, they don't have enough. As of now, Ukraine has received 10 Bergepanzer II from Germany. And as of the 29th of June 2023, Germany sent another 5 units, as well as 2 new generation BPZ-3 Büffels. To be honest, the German Bundeswehr still has 73 of those recovery vehicles laying around in storage. So if NATO wants to plunder the arsenal of the Bundeswehr, it's open bar. Welcome to History Legends and here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. Remember that if you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, just like with many other commentators, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. Okay, back to the burning Bradleys. No offense to you if your name is Brad Lee. Turns out these belong to Ukraine's flagship unit, the 47th Mechanized Brigade. As a reminder, it's the unit with young commanders, the new gen hashtag NATO ones, like Chief Master Sergeant Valery Marcus. Now there's a horrible drone footage of some of his men entering a minefield. Actually, it's the video from the two Bradleys and the T-64 I showed you earlier. It's pretty gore. But yeah, it was really hard for me to watch. We see a platoon-sized unit composed of two M2 Bradleys and a T-64 stuck in open ground. In spite of all the high-tech equipment, I was surprised by how the Ukrainians used a white ribbon to mark the safe and cleared corridor. Despite this measure, they entered the minefield. The mine rolling T-64 and the IFV were hit by anti-tank mines. The normal procedure is that the path they're going to use would have to be cleared by explosives, like the M58 Myclick from the US Army. And then mine sweeping tanks can roll over whatever mines are left. Now there are a lot of theories as to what happened, but since this event took place relatively far from the front line, it's most likely the result of Russians using remote mining systems. Now the tragedy is that this column was ambushed. After one of the Bradleys hit an anti-tank mine, all the Ukrainian infantry inside both IVs got out and stepped right into an anti-personnel minefield. There's one guy that's wounded, his comrade inside the IV quickly jumps to provide first aid's help and himself gets hit by a mine. Another tried to get some supplies from the Bradleys and gets hit too. Judging by the video, of the 13 soldiers, 10 were seriously injured in this episode, of which at least 3 lost limbs. Although no one seems to have been KIA, we still have 10 casualties and 3 irrecoverable losses from an elite unit whose losses cannot easily be replaced. Now that's one event, how many times do you think such things happened in the past month? However, everyone be reassured, because the Washington Post tells us, don't second guess the Ukrainian counteroffensive. it's just starting. Right. Now in the article, they admit the following. The Ukrainian task today is considerably more difficult than it was then, because in the seven months since, the Kremlin has mobilized many more men and built many more fortifications and minefields. The Ukrainians are now advancing through thick minefields across flat open ground. If only someone had talked about all of this a long time ago. And what did the Ukrainians do during these seven months? They sent all their best troops to be mowed down in Bakhmut. And here from French newspaper Le Monde, at the end of the day, Russians are learning how to wage war, said Corporal K of the 116th Mechanized Brigade. Because of all this, the Ukrainians changed tactics. Instead of large armored assaults, they have no other choice but to resort to small infantry infiltrations. Reports mention assaults by platoon-sized units, so roughly 30 to 40 men, sometimes supported by a handful of armored vehicles, like one tank and two IFVs. However, like we've seen with the footage of the Bradleys, even this can become problematic. So on the west side of the front line near Piatihatki, 
the 128th Mountain Brigade did the bulk of the attacks. This time only with infantry. On the 4th of July at 8 a.m., an assault group of 30 men encountered mines and artillery fire, like what they're doing against this Ukrainian squad in this trench. And then artillery tries to intervene as quickly as possible before the enemy infantry relocates. At 8.30, the second wave, another group of 20. They pushed one kilometer from Lopkove. They were detected by artillery and only six made it to Piatihatki. At 9 a.m., the third assault group, 50 soldiers, they advanced from the east for flanking maneuver and once again were stopped by various Russian firepower. That's an entire company gone in one morning. Actually, within an hour. At this rate, by the end of the summer, the 128th Mountain Brigade will be spent. And we have to take into account that those are only the casualties during the actual assault. Without taking into consideration Russian bombardments of areas of concentration or the constant stream of small Ukrainian DRGs composed of 8 to 10 men trying to infiltrate Russian lines. And as you can imagine, in such situations, it's very hard to medevac wounded soldiers. It's pretty sadistic, but it happens quite a lot that one vehicle will come in to pick up some wounded soldiers and they, they get hit on, on the way back. However, what the Ukrainians are doing is not senseless. It's because they have no other choice. Now, there's also a tactical advantage of penetrating through the bush, through the tree lines. It provides camouflage for both manpower and equipment. For drone operators, it's much easier to detect armored formations with big bulky vehicles like this Dutch YPR compared to small groups of ants quickly advancing from one bush to another, which can provide at least some cover for the infantry and these areas are less likely to be mined. One Ukrainian soldier called Excalibur told CBC, the best approach is to bypass the frontal defenses and hit them from the side. Sometimes it requires some acrobatics, but I concur. That's what we do, reconnaissance by force. We go in, make contact, then if they're entrenched, we pull back and try another spot. There's always some place where they will crack. You can never go wrong aiming for the crack. Now, the reality is that most Ukrainian assault battalions are supported by territorial defense units. Let me run you through a scenario. Assault squads secure an enemy position. Then they're immediately rotated out and replaced by mobics or conscripts from terror battalions. Here you can see an example of such rotation. I counted 24 Ukrainian soldiers leaving the force belt they had settled in and replaced by two squads coming in with bags full of supplies and ammunition. Sadly, sometimes the rotation doesn't go as smoothly. Here you can see a BMP picking up seven Ukraine soldiers before getting knocked out by a mine. While the assault squads are refitting at the rear, territorial defense units will take the brunt of Russian artillery. And, the, and it's pretty sadistic too on the Ukrainian side. These guys have, what, three days to two weeks of training at most. There's no way they can storm enemy positions. Let's be honest, for the Ukraine command, these Mobics can't even shoot their guns. And they don't really know what they're getting into, so they'll just sit in trenches in order to occupy the position while new assault squads push on forward to continue the offensive. As you can imagine, such brute force tactics also increase tensions within the ranks of the Ukrainian army. Here you can see a group of soldiers belonging to the 33rd Mechanized Brigade refusing to perform combat missions as they're arguing with their commander. Now, if such an infantry group gets detected, there are really only two options. Get spanked or get spanked while running away. Especially considering the quick reaction time of enemy mortars. Once they zeroed you in, they can release a huge load on your position. Now, the next video I'll show you, I had to censor most of it. But you can see how this squad stayed in this set of trenches. Most likely because half the squad was KIA or wounded. It's horrible. They, they literally piled up on top of each other not knowing what to do. And the worst is that they suffered badly from the follow-up Russian counter-attack. In the end, in this area, only one Ukraine soldier was left. And he, he was captured. Meanwhile, this Ukraine group here preferred to run away as soon as they got detected. Most likely because the tree line they had settled in was too small to provide proper cover. Or simply because they called for support and the Ukraine command said, you guys are on your own. And if they run away because of the failures of their own command, they'll get blamed for it and punished. Overall, Ukraine did make some noticeable gains in the Vremievsky salient using these small group tactics. During our last update, Ukrainian forces had captured this set of villages and hamlets along the Mokra Yali River. But they could not push further as they got caught in a bottleneck. 
By June 24th, they pushed west to capture this set of hills overlooking the villages and the river, and thus breaking the deadlock. This was an important breakthrough because two days later, on the 26th of June, three companies of the 35th Marine Brigade, supported by units of the 128th Territorial Defense, continued the assault. And we can see how they attacked along this one specific tree line. Like a wave, one platoon was sent in, the moment it got washed away, another platoon replaces it, pushes a little bit further, rinse and repeat. Three companies were involved. That's roughly 12 platoons. So you can imagine the intensity of the battle. As an example, these two Ukraine soldiers were captured and claimed that they were part of a reserve unit of the 35th Marine Brigade. Out of the 120 men of the reserve unit, 28 remained in the ranks at the time of their capture. So you can imagine the battle attrition of such attacks. Of course, like any information, especially coming from POWs, take it with a pinch of salt. And what's frustrating for the Ukrainians is that the Russian forces rarely stand their ground and fight to the death for these outposts. More often than not, they simply run away before contact. The Russians are also very sneaky because the defending unit retreats and spreads out in four different directions and then they vanish. After that, Russian artillery and airstrikes pound Ukrainian assault squads and deal as much damage as possible from afar. Then the Russian army counterattacks with fresh troops, plus the units that previously retreated in order to form an augmented attack force. Together they storm the shell-shocked Ukrainians. As of now, Ukraine did not find a solution to this problem. The Ukrainian flanking maneuver from the Marines was combined with the one of the 31st Mechanized Brigade a little bit to the north, which ended up capturing the village of Rivnopil. As you can see in this video of this Ukrainian squad confirming the capture of the settlement. It's also noteworthy that the 32nd Mechanized Brigade that fought in the sector and mostly composed of conscripts was rotated out and removed from the front altogether. We can speculate as to why this was done, but you can have an idea. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian 37th Marine Brigade has not been able to make any progress on the east side of the salient. It was a unit equipped with a number of French AMX-10 RC wheeled tanks. Reportedly, the French light tanks performed poorly, mainly because of its thin armor. We're talking about 20 to 40 millimeter. Apparently, all over the front, 9 of the 30 that have been delivered to Ukraine are already destroyed or damaged. One 34-year-old battalion commander of the 37th Marine Brigade told France 24, There was artillery shelling and a 152mm shell exploded near the vehicle. The fragments pierced the armor and the ammunition set detonated. The crew of 4 inside were all KIA. Essentially, the battalion commander said that the AMX-10 cannot be used for offensive operations, which could explain why the 37th Marine Brigade has not taken a huge role lately. However, since then, in the Vremivsky salient, Ukraine went through a huge rotation of forces which restored its combat capabilities. Now that Ukrainians have straightened the front line, they are attempting to flank the village of Staromayorsky from the west, while putting pressure on Priutny from the north. On July 2nd, satellite imagery shows how the Ukrainians are pushing along these three tree lines to get a foothold inside the village. You probably notice it's always the same tactics. At the same time, on July 3rd, the Russians reported the involvement of artillery units of the 72nd Brigade in the Vremyevsky salient, which is abnormal considering it was assigned to the Vohledar sector. Once again, we can speculate as to why this was done. The most straightforward answer could be that Ukraine has lost a significant amount of artillery pieces and that they needed rapid replacements in order to carry on the offensive. Here you can see drone footage of the supposed destruction of four Ukrainian self-propelled howitzers, one British AS-90, one American M109 Paladin, and two Polish AHS Krab. With that being said, if the assault on the Zaporozhye front for Ukraine has not met expectations, Ukraine is making significant gains south of Bakhmut. But that's for another video. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.